We're going to be moving to the next presentation. I am inviting the speakers to join. Should be here in a second. Hello, Victoria. How are you doing? Hi. Good to see you. Hello, Menelos. How are you doing today? Hello, Vicente. Great. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Where are you writing us from? Uh, Vancouver, BC, Canada. Nice. Uh, all right. So who's going to sh be sharing the presentation here? Um, I'll be sharing. All right. Let's make it happen. Just make sure everything works correctly. Then I'm going to be doing a brief introduction and get out of your way. All right. Can you see that? Yeah, perfect. OK, so this uh, let's let's uh, let's start right now. So this is going to be the last presentation of this track, um, you know, the technical stage. So Menelos and Victoria, they're both senior developers at Trulia, and they're going to be talking about how navigating, how to navigate the sea of the JavaScript tools to discover scalable tools and continuous delivery. Uh, so please take it away. I'm leaving the stage. It's all yours. Yeah, thank you, Vicenzo. Hello, ABI Days. Uh, we are super happy to be here virtually. Uh, we have attended a couple of uh, API days in the past, uh, but it's the first virtual event, and uh, uh, it's quite exciting to see, you know, how how well organized it is and how people still interact uh, smoothly. Um, so yeah, during the presentation, I'll be we'll be uh, keeping an eye on the chat. So uh, we want to, to to see your your questions and answer, and please uh, let let up your any feedback. So uh, I'm Menelaus, and uh, we have Vicky, and uh, we are from Trulio. Uh, at Trulio, we do online identity verification. And we are super excited today to showcase you um, about how we really uh, choose and pick the right tools, um, predominantly in JavaScript, uh, with uh, continuous uh, delivery in mind. And just to, to get an idea, and you can write in the chat um, with a whether or not you are familiar with continuous delivery, is that concept uh, a new uh, new to you, or uh, are you familiar with this? I'll, I'll begin with just writing uh, a yes, um, and you can probably say yes, no, depending on how. Uh, okay, I see Vincenzo is, uh, knows uh, knows uh, stuff, so that's great. Um, so yeah, I mean uh, the whole uh, we will we will dive in uh, into the actual agenda of today. Um, and so uh, what we'll be talking about, and Vicky, if you can uh, go into the next slide. Yeah. Perfect, yeah. So uh, we'll be talking about the growing pains. Um, and so uh, some of the teams, uh, we will be showcasing you what was our growing pains and how we, we got around them. Uh, we will be showcasing you uh, how to utilize continuous delivery in order to increase your throughput of your teams. Um, then uh, Vicky will showcase how to actually, what, what kind of framework to, do we choose uh, for picking the right tools. And uh, for those of you who are uh, familiar with JavaScript land, there are many, many tools to choose. So uh, this is quite an exciting methodology. Uh, we'll be diving into the team principles. Um, and then finally, uh, we'll be showcasing some of the continuous improvement methodology that uh, we actually follow. So um, let's dive into the actual problem. So what, what do we really want to showcase uh, here in this presentation? So at Trulio, we had, a, we had a, an idea. And that idea was Embed ID, um, which we will be showcasing later. Um, and so what we wanted is we, we, what we ended up doing is we gathered a handful of developers. And we say that uh, we will build an MVP. And so we built that MVP and uh, eventually uh, led to a hypothesis of success. So meaning uh, we, we started seeing some customer traction and we're seeing that uh, our customers were interested in more and more features. And so what our project uh, engineering and our product management uh, team uh, end up doing is that they gathered together and they created a roadmap. And so that roadmap contained uh, various of uh, Various of uh, features. There were a lot of uh, requests and a lot of, uh, uh, you know, as a roadmap should be two or three years uh, of features. So we'll, uh, what we ended up doing is like, great. Let's onboard. Uh, let's double our team and let's onboard more and more developers. So uh, we did that and uh, we started hitting some of the problems of the growing pains. 
And so for those of you who have been in a similar scenario, uh, you when you're starting to onboard, uh, from when you go from a small team to a large team, you notice issues with uh, developer productivity going down and uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, pain points that uh, they, they really need to be addressed before you really onboard all these people. And so what we ended up uh, doing is we utilize uh, continuous, continuous aggression and continuous delivery uh, and for those of you, because I see a couple of you that say no, and that's fine if you haven't uh, heard of uh, uh, continuous segregation or continuous delivery. But the idea is that uh, uh, we basically uh, manage our workflows uh, fully autonomously. So uh, what a, by continuous integration is really the idea that uh, we will be writing tasks that uh, will be automatically executed on code commit um, and on various events that I'll be showcasing you. And then finally, with continuous delivery, we are able to release our product directly without any human influence uh, whatsoever or any manual task in the process of code commit uh, to customer. So uh, truly, we are very happy that, and confident in our ability to uh, actually onboard uh, several developers and uh, uh, lead the success successfully lead to a, to a great product in the end. So let's see uh, in more detail uh, about how we do uh, continuous uh, integration with the delivery. Um, Vicky, can you? Uh, yeah, perfect. Thank you. So um, again, just uh, the concept of continuous integration. Um, so we have a commit and uh, we, we commit our code into our favorite VCS. In our case, it's GitHub. Uh, and so that commit has a checksum. And so um, every time we commit there will be some workflows uh, that will be triggered from our uh, ci now in our case uh, we, we use various tools one of uh, that we will be showcasing here is uh, github actions um of course uh, there are many other tools that are great to like uh, many of you are familiar with there might be some jenkins or some uh, circle ci and uh, they are quite similar so uh, what we end up doing after every time uh, we trigger our workflows is that we run several tools. Um, and some notable uh, tools are Sonar Cloud. Um, and this Sonar Cloud uh, is, a, is a great tool for static analysis uh, of the code base. And then we also have FOSASCAN, which is a great other tool that uh, allows us to, to see whether we can really use our dependencies as we should. Um, you know, like when you're, when you're, especially in the NPM land, there are many uh, licenses uh, that uh, forbid the, the usage, uh, especially when you're writing a, uh, a code base that uh, leads to a profit. So you, you make sure, you need to make sure that first, uh, all of your dependencies uh, do not contain any vulnerabilities, and then that you also are allowed to use uh, such, uh, such tools. So those, those are the great frameworks that uh, do this job for us. So after we execute our tests and uh, everything uh, is successful, uh, we ship our product to QA, which uh, they run their own QA automation. And uh, right after the QA uh, is finalized, we finally release. And uh, what you see on your right side is really Embed ID, uh, which is a, an, a low code, no code solution for, uh, for really micro front ends. So, so uh, we, we, we are definitely uh, shipped that product uh, just, re just a while ago. And, uh, uh, you know, this is the whole idea of uh, how how we go from code commit to actually uh, shipping uh, to customers. However, I I talked a little bit about triggering workflows, but what is really a workflow and how does it uh, how does it really look like? And so um, let's let's dive deep into how how a workflow looks like. So in this example, uh, we are seeing a GitHub action. And uh, my uh, point here is that uh, I want to write an action that uh, will be uh, releasing autonomously every time I ship to and I merge my code into master. So I want to write an action that every time I merge into master, I want to um, autonomously uh, publishing my package to NPM. So let's see, on our left side, we see branches master. So we defined our branches, so this is that this is the equivalent of every time you merge into master, then what we do is we define our environment. So we say that, uh, okay, we are running on Ubuntu. Uh, we, we give our Node.js versions um, and we support 14 uh, uh, and more. Now, of course, this is a matrix, so you can, uh, you can specify as many versions as you want. And then we go on the right side. So on the right side, 
we really we really have this uh, very small chunk of code base and what we really define is a register url so really where you want to publish you pass in your secrets so this is uh, from uh, we, we grab the secrets from github uh, actions of course if you're using aws uh, it's going to be slightly different, but uh, you, can, you can use the AWS parameter store, but the idea is still the same. Um, and then you run an npm config set. So if your tokens are valid and if everything is smooth, um, the npm who am I will uh, validate you and you'll, you'll be seeing that, okay, we, you've been actually authenticated into the system. Right after we run npm npmci, which is uh, uh, equivalent to npm install, and then finally, uh, we do an NPM run test. Um, and so a crucial point here is that you don't want to be releasing something that is uh, half broken or uh, their tests are failing. So this really guarantees you that every time before you release, um, everything is smoothly and everything has run smoothly before you release. Um, now, last but not least, and uh, this uh, we use a semantic release tool in this example. Um, and this great tool allows you to dynamically define uh, versions by your git commit tag. So when you're releasing a package, you usually say that, oh, I want to release my 1.0.1 version. But this great tool actually allows you to, uh, to tag your commit, and then it manages the version bump for you, whether it's a major, minor, or a patch, depending on your sender version. So that's that's the uh, the concept of uh, of uh, the workflows and the GitHub actions, and uh, I'll pass it to Vicky now to show some of uh, our uh, frameworks and how we pick and choose the right tools. Vicky, yeah, thanks, Mane. Um, so as Mane mentioned, our aim is CI/CD, and as developers, one of the biggest things that we can do um, to enable CI/CD is be really really confident in our code. Um, so there are so many available tools um, to manage code bases um, and try and you know reduce the amount of bugs that you're introducing into your code. So in this section, we're going to cover kind of how you go from this overwhelming sea of JavaScript libraries to something a bit more like this, um, and really pick and choose the right tools for you. So first of all. Probably the biggest question, what languages are you, are you going to use? Um, and I'd be kind of really interested to know what languages um, other people out there use. So yeah, feel free to post in the chat and like say why you used um, TypeScript or JavaScript or anything else you choose to use. Um, obviously, for TypeScript and JavaScript, you know there are pros and cons to each language. Um, and I've outlined the pros um, in underline in this slide. So for JavaScript, you know, it's super easy to learn, um, and it doesn't need to be compiled, so it's, it's really, really fast to code. Whereas TypeScript, it has that steeper learning curve, and it does need to be compiled um, as you're coding. But then for us, the benefits of TypeScript, you know, it's statically typed, um, and that means that it throws errors at compile time rather than at runtime. So as you're writing code, any kind of typing bugs that you're introducing you're not going to be able to compile that code. So you're not going to introduce those into production um, without realizing it. It also gives you types and interfaces. Um, and this means that it's, it's a lot, lot simpler to code across large repositories and to refactor very quickly um, with fewer bugs. So for us, the choice was pretty clear because we want high quality code. Um, we decided to go for TypeScript. It has that slightly steeper learning curve, but um, it, it allows us to be a lot more confident in our code. And next, um, are you going to go for trunk-based or branch-based? Um, if you're not aware of these terms, um, trunk-based basically means that you're always running off of one main master branch, um, and that branch is always production-ready, um, Whereas branch-based, you might have multiple feature branches running um, with different teams committing to different feature branches and then merging the branches back into main um, once those features are fully fully um, finished. So we've actually kind of hopped between these two approaches um, over the last year. And we did very much go down the branch-based route for a while, um, mostly because 
we don't have to worry about Im immature code not being released to production. Um, we would sort of code all of our features onto a feature branch, then go through a big QA cycle and then um, merge back in. But this did lead to a kind of merge hell with a lot of rebasing on top of other teams' um, features that have been developed since our feature branch merged off. Um, and it also means there's a lot of main branches to maintain, um, which means that you know your DevOps might have to manage multiple environments. Um, and it's just a bit of a headache in general. So we've recently moved over to trunk-based. The main advantages are that you have these short-lived branches. Um, it's a lot easier to rebase onto master. Um, and there are fewer environments um, and versions of the code base to maintain. The main issue with this approach is that your code does need to be production ready. Um, and for us, we use a tool called Optimizely to enable us to get around this. And Optimizely allows you to use um, feature flags. So we can put any work in progress code behind a feature flag and only turn that that feature flag on in, say, our dev environment or our dev and our QA environment and leave it turned off in our production environment until we're actually ready to release that feature. You do need your developers to be um, at a certain maturity, I'd say, to use this um, and make sure you know you're, you're really thorough with code reviews to make sure that no code accidentally gets into production without being behind a feature flag if it's not production ready. Um, but for our team, this has been working really, really well for us. And now let's talk a little bit about other libraries um, and what factors we actually choose when we're deciding a library. And for me, I think the most important thing when I'm choosing a library or a tool is to choose what works for our team. Um, or it might be company-wide if you're choosing frameworks and tool sets for your whole company. Um, and by this, I mean each team is different. We have different developers with different expertise. We have different release processes, um, different you know, time that we want to take from development to production. So the tool set that everyone uses is going to be very, very slightly dip different depending on their use case. The next two points are kind of linked. Is the tool set necessary? Um, and does it actually do what you want it to do? There are lots of very fancy libraries out there that do, you know, all sorts of automated testing on your on your libraries um, and your code bases. But you want to make sure that the tool sets and the libraries you're using actually do do the feature that you want it to do, um, rather than just going with whatever the industry tells you is standard. Um, the next couple. So you want a library that's regularly maintained. Um, you want to check if it has any vulnerabilities and how quickly bugs are resolved. When was it last released? All of those things tell you how often that code base is being worked on um, and how up to date and how modern it is. Um, and also, is it open source or not? And this one, you know, it might be a pro, it might be a con, um, just depending on your feeling. If it's open source, then you can, you know, you can try and submit code if there is a bug, um, rather than having to wait. Um, it's kind of up to you. Next, does it have an active community? You want something where if you have a problem integrating, you can super easily Google, go on Stack Overflow, find an answer, move on. You're not blocked for weeks waiting for that company who's developed that library to respond to you. And also how large it is. Um, for us, this is only really relevant for our production dependencies. So anything that's actually going into our bundle um, that we deploy. Um, and we use a tool called Bundle Phobia, which um, basically tells you how large the minified li library is. Um, and we just use that to make sure that we're not putting anything huge into our bundle so that our site is uh, slow and less responsive. So a couple of the other tools that we use to ensure code quality across um, our software. And one of the biggest things for us is testing. So we have across all of our code bases, 100% unit co test coverage. And we also have a full automation test suite um, that covers um, all of our use cases across our sites. Um, and for these, we use Jest. Um, Jest isn't actually standard for QA to use, but our QA team decided to use Jest um, with Selenium um, because it gave them the flexibility to build their own custom um, automation test suite. 
It also allows them to test run uh, to run tests in parallel, which speeds up the automation test suite quite significantly. And the team did already have knowledge of Jest, so it was um, easier for them to integrate with. We also have decided to use a code analysis scanner and a vulnerability scanner. For these, we use SonarCloud. Um, and this we run on pull requests. Um, and it basically allows us, before we actually merge code to master, to know if we have inadvertently introduced any simple bugs that we could have fixed or duplicate code. Um, and also keep on top of any um, dependencies we use and make sure that we are aware of those vulnerabilities and we can fix them as soon as they're flagged. And so I'll pass back on to Minnie. Yeah, thanks, Vicky. Um, and uh, I see a couple of questions, so we'll be uh, answering those uh, by the end of the session. Um, but uh, great, congratulations. So uh, we, we reached the point where uh, we have a scalable solution and uh, uh, developers are happy and productive. Now what? So uh, the art of the gatekeeping, right? So yeah, sure, you reach the point that uh, yeah, the, the code base is great, but now how do you maintain that? And uh, there are a couple of things that uh, we are doing at Truly and uh, uh, we, we really think that those, uh, he, uh, those things help uh, maintain the standard. And one of them is uh, design reviews. So design review is really the concept uh, of uh, uh, a developer um, uh, and presenting the architecture uh, to other developers prior to starting the, the, the coding part. So what that really means is that uh, before in for larger stories, uh, breaking down the task and making a proposal and architecture solution, and then jumping into the implementation after you have uh, the check mark from other people, that's great. And uh, in our experience, we, we've seen that uh, that saves us a lot of time because uh, there are multiple occasions in the past where we've seen that uh, developers start committing code and they start to implementing this great uh, gigantic or big PR, and then all of a sudden uh, the architecture is flawed. So uh, then you see that you, you basically have to redo work. So these things are really caught during design review and design review is really something that we utilize heavily, especially in the more complex uh, features um, priors even starting to implement it to implementing now another great uh, uh and i think undervalued uh, uh skill set that we use is uh, code reviews and i am pretty sure a lot of you many of all of you are familiar with code reviews um it really code reviews if done properly they can really help maintain and increase the standards now uh when a code review is not that useful uh, when when you're doing when you are uh, applying a code review and you are saying okay well there there you should be using a tab or you should be using spaces and and um, and uh, you are making comments re depending on uh, on the style on the format of the code then that's not really uh, useful and you should be really utilizing some kind of a linter or some kind of like a tool that runs before uh, code commit that uh, ensures uh, ensures that the, the code is properly formatted. Uh, and the reason is that developers should really focus on the logic of the code and the quality of the code uh, rather than just uh, syntax uh, sugar. So we've seen that uh, if you have a tool like a proper linter ahead of time, it really helps the developers and your team focus on the, on the things that are important for the story. Uh, and last but not least, in our team, we've seen that it really works well. Uh, we have a, one dedicated person uh, that uh, is on tech debt rotation. And what this personal responsibility on every sprint is to rotate and basically go into every project and and address uh, tech debt, uh, tech debt uh, uh, tasks and stories. So we've seen that uh, there's always gonna be uh, some bugs and there's always gonna be some code that is not uh, the best code. Um, and we've seen that uh, if, you are, if you are making this part of your culture, and not something that uh, someone has to do uh, once or twice every sprint, uh, then that will really help maintain uh, high standards. And uh, this is a great role that we utilize also heavily in our team. And uh, we have a dedicated resource just to address uh, tech, that, uh, uh, tech that stuff, literally. So um, we, we, we use that and uh, we really uh, want to showcase you about like, the continuous, uh, continuous improvement. So uh, what, are, what, what are most things that uh, we can do uh, in the future to, to, to keep on maintaining the standard? 
Um, and what we've seen and where we want to go is basically we want to offer the developer the end-to-end -end ownership standard. So what that means is that a developer is responsible uh, from the time they commit code to the time the code is arrived in uh, production. And so um, this can be achieved by, uh, by allowing developer to literally uh, be responsible for uh, both the development part of it, but also the testing part of it. So really, really having a developer write both, both the actual feature code, but as well as a QA logic. And this can be achieved uh, from the QA automation uh, uh, standpoint that uh, I showed you earlier in the, in the previous slide. Um, and lead time, and I don't know about how many of you know uh, the concept of lead time is uh, the concept from Accelerate series, but it's really the idea of how much time does it take for you to ship a product from the time you first code commit. So how much time does it take for your product to be arrived in customer hands from the first time it was uh, committed into a dev environment? And that's really lead time. Uh, and our, our, in our mindset is that we want to do whatever we can to decrease that lead time because we want to really keep on uh, shipping software as fast as we can. And really, uh, our goal is to decrease that down, down in an hour or less. So basically, you, you write code, you test it, and then it automatically ships uh, into, into customer hand. And last but not least, uh, now we have this uh, gigantic uh, framework and platform, and uh, it's easy to stay behind, and it's easy really to have it uh, as a, uh, you know, be, be legacy. Uh, so I think, and what we've seen, uh, we've seen in our state is that uh, uh, by increasing experimentation, you keep uh, people still excited. So you have that uh, early on excitement that you used to have, and you still are experimenting, even if the project is big. So uh, by increasing experimentation, we've seen that uh, there is a lot of uh, increase into developer productivity and developer happiness. And so uh, with that in mind, I'll uh, pass it to Vicky to uh, summarize the presentation. Vicky. Yeah, so kickstarting a JavaScript project um, can be pretty daunting initially, but the ability to pick and choose the right tools will significantly help your team. Um, and we want to focus on productivity boosting methodologies. Um, trunk based development, in addition to feature flags, can significantly help with maintenance um, and the release cycle. And continuous integration can really determine the project success. Um, and we also recommend to make code and design reviews, as well as a tech deck rotation role, a part of your culture. So, yeah, thanks for joining. Um, come and say hi in our booth. Um, I think we have a couple of questions in the chat. That we can go yeah, um, uh, so, yeah, there are, there uh, are questions. Yeah. yeah, there are some questions. I'm, I'm going to be reading those one for you so you can concentrate the response. So first of all, uh, do you develop against multiple logical release candidates simultaneously or not? No, so we only ever have one release candidate. Um, basically, the way that we manage that is we have a very, very frequent release cycle. So we typically release um, twice a week, um, which means that each individual release is very, very small. Um, and we also use feature flags. So if we have multiple different teams working on different projects within one code base, they'll all be working behind different feature flags. So we can release their code comfortably in production, knowing that we haven't actually turned that feature flag on yet. So no one's going to be able to access their code in production, right? So that's how we manage that. OK. Uh, another question I see here interesting. What percentage of your dev staff is assigned to technical debt remediation at any given time? Yeah, that's a, that's actually a good question, and uh, we are still experimenting on finding the the healthy balance here. Uh, but really, is uh, is we de dedicated full time uh, one person uh, from our team, and our, our team is uh, consists of approximately like fifteen uh, to twenty devs. Uh, so really, uh, it's I would say like one one fifteen. Uh, but we're really experimenting, and I I would see that number uh, grow as we grow. On growing and growing, of course. Day. So you want to aim like yeah, I, I can see that happening. Understand. Yeah. All right. Let's read the last one. Does your UX staff review candidate code prior to deployment to production? 
Um, by U, uh, UX stuff, uh, and I guess uh, you mean uh, the actual, so if there is any usability testing prior shipping to production, is that uh, probably the question, right? I can't really say, like I'm just reading yeah. the question. I, th I think what he's asking is that, is the UX reviewing the actual code, you know, the React component or whatever it is? Okay, okay, I see. Yeah, yeah. So definitely, uh, we we don't uh, usually the product managers and designers are not really affiliated in the code base. Uh, what they're really primarily responsibility is to actually um, make sure uh, deliver a, a user experience, and then we pass they pass it in into uh, us into the developers who actually uh, uh, inc develop the actual experience. Yeah, they do. Um approve as part of our flow so we develop um that goes to product manager review and that would include a check against the original design to make sure that it falls within that um and then it goes to qa um and for larger tickets um we kind of just have a very open culture with our team um this kind of goes for design reviews as well like if anyone wants extra reviews it's very very open in our team that if you're developing and you want to make sure that's, that the something looks okay, just ask a PM to do a desk review with you um, and like screen share and talk them through it and ask for feedback. Um, so that's what Fair we tend to do. Fair enough. All right, so I, I can see there are other questions, but we're running out of time. You know, we want to make sure that people can jump on the other stage. So thank you very much, Victoria and Meralos, to staying with us today. Uh, this concludes our technical track. So it has been a pleasure to be your my your MC and presenting uh, this technical thing at API Days New York 2020. My name is Vincenzo. I work for Stoplight, um, and uh, you know I'll see you on the main stage for the next presentations. Thank you very much. <laughs>